Hi, I'm Frank David from the biotech consulting firm Pharmagellan, and this video is an introduction to time to event studies and Kaplan Meier curves. If you're interested in biotech, I bet you've seen staircase pictures like these. They're super common, especially in cancer and cardiology. But do you know how to get the most information out of them or spot the red flags? If not, I've got you covered. This is the first of four videos I made to help you get smarter about analyzing time to event studies and Kaplan Meier curves. In this video, we'll answer two basic questions about time to event studies and Kaplan Meier curves. What are they, and what do you need to know about how they're performed to interpret the results? In later videos in this series, we'll talk about the numbers, the figures themselves, and important red flags. Before we get started, two quick points. First, if you're rusty on math, do not worry. You don't need to be a stats guru to learn from this video. I made it specifically for folks who aren't experts in clinical development or biostatistics. If you have at least some experience reading drug companies' press releases and presentations about trial results, you are in the right place. That includes biotech investors, equity analysts, bankers, consultants, and entrepreneurs, as well as pharma folks in areas like medical affairs and marketing. Second, if you like this video, make sure to check out the other episodes in the series. You might also like our free white paper on interpreting study results, as well as our comprehensive handbook that helps non-experts analyze every aspect of biotech clinical trials. There's info about all of these items in the description below and on our website, pharmagellan.com. Okay, let's get started. An important thing to realize about graphs like these is that even though the staircases go down in one figure and up in the other, the underlying trials are pretty similar. Both studies measure how a drug affects the time before a patient dies or has some sort of non-fatal bad outcome, like going to the hospital or having their tumor progress. Just like the name implies, a time-to-event study estimates the amount of time that passes from when a patient is treated with a drug until they experience a defined event. In most of these studies in drug development, the event is something bad and the drug is meant to reduce its incidence. To understand what I mean, let's look closer at the examples I showed earlier. This event curve is from Amarin's Phase 3 Reduces study. This trial tested whether a purified fatty acid, Vasipa, could prevent major adverse cardiovascular events, including death and non-fatal heart attacks or strokes. As you move to the right on the x-axis, the percent of patients who have experienced an event is shown on the y-axis. At the beginning of the study, at time zero, no one has had an event. So you start at zero on the y-axis. But as time passes, the percent of patients who have had events increases, so the lines go up and to the right. The Vasipa line has a smaller slope than the placebo line, which means the drug is effective at preventing events. For example, after four years, it looks like about 20% of patients on placebo had a cardiovascular event, but only about 15% of those treated with Vasipa. The other example I showed is the Kaplan-Meier curve from a Phase 2b study Ariatech ran to compare its new drug candidate, Ariaspace, plus chemo, to chemo alone in pancreatic cancer patients. The event being measured here is death, but the y-axis measures percent survival. So here, both lines start at the top left-hand corner, which is 100% survival at time zero. As time passes, we move to the right, and the curves slope downward as patients die. Like in the Vesipa study, the fact that the line for the area space treated patients has a smaller slope than the control means that fewer patients experience the event over time. So at 25 weeks, for example, it looks like about 55% of the area space patients were still alive, compared with only about 35% of the patients in the control arm. Now, a key thing you need to understand about how these studies are done in order to interpret the results is called censoring. To explain it, let's go back to the Vasipa example. In that trial, we're counting non-fatal heart attacks and strokes, plus deaths from one of those two causes. That should be pretty clear cut. Those events either happen or they don't, and there shouldn't be much mystery. But actually, there are three groups of patients in Reduce It that could cause headaches. First, what about patients who dropped out of the trial? Every clinical study has dropouts, and it turns out that just over 10% of the almost 8,200 patients in Reduce It quit the trial after randomization. They didn't have heart attacks or strokes, but they didn't not have them either. We just don't know. Second are the patients who had what's called a competing event. About 2% of patients in Reduce It died from some other cause, like cancer or a car accident. 
They didn't have a heart attack or stroke, but like the dropouts, they might have had one if they'd been in the study longer. The third group of problematic patients has to do with the fact that at the end of a trial, not every remaining patient was in the study for the same amount of time. Reduce it enrolled patients from late 2011 to 2016, and the primary analysis was conducted in mid-2018. That means that at the time of the primary analysis, some patients had been observed for over six years, but others had been studied for only about two years. Obviously, it's not fair to consider the second group event-free to the same extent. These are all examples of censoring that leave us a bit in limbo. All we know for sure about those censored patients is that there was some period of time during which they were event-free. After that, it's anyone's guess. The way statisticians handle censoring is to use the observed patients in each arm to estimate what would have happened to the censored ones in that arm. That's kosher from a methods point of view, but it means the final results that you and I see reflect a combination of actual events experienced by patients, plus estimates of what would have happened to the censored patients if they'd continued in the trial. Now, I bet you're wondering why I'm telling you this. The reason you need to understand censoring is to be aware of something called uninformative censoring. Uninformative censoring is a key principle of time to event studies, and when you see a trial where you suspect that principle may have been violated, it is a huge red flag. We'll talk more about this in the final video in this series on red flags. But for now, let's just go over a quick hypothetical example so you understand what I mean. Let's imagine that we're running a trial of an anti-cancer drug using progression-free survival, or PFS, as the primary event. And let's also imagine that the anti-cancer drug we're studying doesn't work very well. So patients in the drug arm are very likely to withdraw from the study, maybe because their cancer symptoms got worse as they were just starting to regress. In a typical time-to-event study, we'd estimate the PFS for those censored patients based on the observed PFS from the other drug-treated patients. But in this case, that doesn't make sense, because the censored patients actually did worse than the uncensored ones. We just didn't know because they dropped out. That's informative censoring, because we're potentially losing the worst responders to the drug, and the better responders are the ones who stayed in. Remember I told you that in a time-to-event study, statisticians use the observed patients treated with the drug to derive an estimate of how the dropouts in the same study would have done. But if we do that here, we'll overestimate the drug's true effect. This is a well-documented issue in cancer trials that use endpoints besides overall survival as their primary endpoint. We'll talk about this some more in the Red Flags video, but for now, I just want you to understand how censoring works and start brainstorming what sorts of things might cause it to be informative and bias the results. Okay, that's it for this introduction to Time to Event Studies and Kaplan-Meier Curves. There are links below to the other three videos in this series where I'll discuss how to interpret the numbers and graphs and also highlight some important red flags. And once again, if you're a non-stats expert who wants to get smarter about analyzing biotech clinical trials, please check out our free white paper on interpreting clinical study results, as well as our detailed guidebook, The Pharmagellan Guide to Analyzing Biotech Clinical Trials, available on Amazon. There's info on both of these items below and also at pharmagellan.com. Thanks for watching.